My name is Dr. Katz, I'm a non-invasive cardiologist, and today we're gonna to be talking about palpitations. Palpitations are the abnormal sensation of your heart beating. It can be a symptom of a systemic or cardiovascular issue or a diagnosis all on its own. This video is perfect for any medical trainee or patient who wants to better understand the pathophysiology behind the most common causes of palpitations, as well as the appropriate diagnostic and therapeutic evaluation that we often employ in the clinic and inside the hospital in order to better understand and evaluate what the underlying cause of your palpitations may be. The most common cause of palpitations are PACs and PVCs, premature atrial and premature ventricular contractions, or extra heartbeats from the top and bottom chambers of the heart. Before we get into all the other possible causes of palpitations, I wanna explain why you feel those symptoms when you have a PAC or a PVC, one of those extra heartbeats from the top or bottom chambers of the heart. Whenever you have a PAC or a PVC, the electrical system fires a little bit prematurely. The heart's response to that is to have a compensatory pause. Immediately following that PAC or PVC, the extra heartbeat, the heart will have a slightly longer period of relaxation. That compensatory pause is going to allow the heart's electrical system to get back on the same page. The heart tells itself, hey, don't beat, Let's get everyone back on the same page so we can work in unison again. Now, while the heart is going through this compensatory pause, the heart is passively filling with more blood. And when the heart fills with more blood, that next heartbeat is gonna be a little bit more powerful because the heart is getting stretched more. And then when it beats, it has to eject a little bit extra blood. And that's why after a PAC or PVC, patients can often complain of feeling like that extra heartbeat is a little bit extra strong or why they might have fullness in the neck or the jaw because that extra blood that filled in the heart during the compensatory pause is literally now ejecting out of the heart and going to the aorta and the great vessels and you can kind of feel that. PACs and PVCs can be something that happens all on their own and be completely benign. In some of the tests that I'll review later on in this video, if you have a very low burden of them, less than 1%, it's typically considered benign and nothing to worry about. There are some red flag symptoms, things that can be dangerous and need to be further evaluated, like nearly passing out or passing out, having chest pain with it, feeling excessive shortness of breath, dyspnea on exertion, any symptom really that would make you go, I should see a doctor immediately. You probably should. Now, PACs and PVCs can happen on their own, and I'll get into the diagnostic workup that we do for palpitations, but often if it's a low burden, they can just happen. You can be still the healthiest person in the world and just have a few extra PACs or PVCs and it not be something to worry about. Let's take a look at the laundry list of other possible etiologies that this can be. There are a lot of different causes of palpitations, some of them cardiac and some of them non-cardiac. Some of the simple ones are easily evaluated with a simple blood test. Things like anemia or low blood count can be checked with a CBC or complete blood count as having less blood is gonna make your heart beat a little bit faster and can cause palpitations or that abnormal sensation. Hyperthyroidism can be checked with a simple TSH and reflex T4. Abnormal electrolyte levels can be checked with a BMP or a basic metabolic panel. Certain drugs like withdrawing from beta blockers. Beta blockers are a medication that cardiologists and physicians use frequently. And the effect that they have is that they slow the heart rate. So if we stop that drug at a high dose very abruptly, it can kind of cause a rebound effect and cause your heart rate to go a little bit faster and possibly that abnormal sensation of palpitations. That's why if I use beta blockers and I want the patient to stop taking them, unless they're already on a low dose, I will often titrate them down. Other drugs like methamphetamine and cocaine can certainly cause palpitations and some other negative cardiac consequences. And other more common substances like alcohol, which can directly irritate the heart, and tobacco or other nicotine containing products like vapes. Some very common things like excessive caffeine intake can contribute to palpitations. I know this seems a little bit basic and often whenever you go to the doctor and you're talking about palpitations, we'll say, hey, just cut out caffeine. We don't mean to say that the caffeine is necessarily 100% the culprit, but we can at least rule out, did this help with your symptoms or not? I know for instance, if I drink more than a second cup of coffee, right on that third cup, I don't feel any less tired, I just start getting palpitations. So sometimes it might not be just using some caffeine intake at all, but really excessive caffeine intake that can prompt some individuals to be a little bit more sensitive to it. Another condition called obstructive sleep apnea can certainly cause palpitations and other abnormal heart rhythms. I go into a little bit of detail about obstructive sleep apnea in my other video about atrial fibrillation, another possible cause of palpitations, which I'll get into in a minute. But obstructive sleep apnea is typically seen in older patients where the normal mechanism that our body uses to ensure that we don't act out our dreams is that our body gets paralyzed when we sleep. But sometimes as we age, a little bit more weight gets on the neck and it can cause the airway to close up. You don't have to be overweight. 
our bodies aren't made perfectly and you can be in perfect health and still get obstructive sleep apnea. And often these patients who essentially stop breathing in the middle of the night, it causes the heart to realize, hey, we're not getting enough oxygen and can cause nighttime and then proceeding into daytime palpitations and other heart rhythm abnormalities. Obstructive sleep apnea can be evaluated, if appropriate, with a sleep study. Another very common thing that I see in the cardiology clinic for palpitations is anxiety. Anxiety can cause palpitations because if anyone's ever been anxious or had a panic attack before, your heart is thumping and it can make you feel like you're having palpitations. And it's sometimes hard to know, is this just anxiety or is there something else going on? That's why to me, anxiety is always a diagnosis of exclusion. Certainly I evaluate that for any patient that has palpitations. And although I might suspect that the number one cause is likely anxiety, patients with anxiety can still have any of these other issues. So it's important that you listen to your patients and do a thorough investigation, talk to them and order any appropriate tests that you might need. On top of that, having palpitations can certainly worsen your anxiety and then having anxiety is gonna cause some palpitations, which will make you more anxious and it can cause this negative feedback loop. Sometimes at least evaluating other possible cardiac causes can improve anxiety about that sensation that they're having. While we can currently work with a primary care physician or a psychiatrist to potentially treat that anxiety if we need to. Now the primary cardiac causes I normally break up into electrical and mechanical issues. Electrical issues are typically arrhythmias or abnormal heart rhythms. I know I've mentioned PACs and PVCs, that can be normal, but if PVCs happen so frequently that a large percentage of your total heartbeats within a day are composed of these extra heartbeats, it can actually cause a tachycardia mediated cardiac cardiomyopathy. That fast abnormal heart rhythm can eventually weaken the heart muscle. There's no absolute number that we look for. Typically we teach medical students and residents that 10% of extra heartbeats being composed of PVCs or abnormal heart rhythms can increase your risk of causing tachycardia mediated cardiomyopathy. But it's not like if you have 9% you're safe and if you have 11% you're definitely going to get it. Every patient's a little bit different and there's no absolute threshold that I'm aware of that will cause this tachycardia mediated cardiomyopathy, but we know that people with a high burden are certainly at a higher risk. And even if a patient isn't terribly symptomatic, a very high PVC burden would prompt me to wanna to treat that with some beta blockers or rate control medications to kind of suppress those extra heartbeats. Again, not all palpitations are gonna cause a weakening of the heart muscle, but if the underlying cause of your palpitations is an excessively high degree or number of abnormal heart rhythms, it can be something more serious and can have serious complications. Echocardiography or an ultrasound of the heart is sometimes performed in the evaluation of a patient with palpitations. Specifically, what I'm looking for are possible abnormalities of the heart muscle, like a cardiomyopathy or weakening of the heart muscle. A little bit more rare, but still common. Things like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in older patients, valvular stenosis or severe regurgitation or leakiness of the valve. So part of my routine evaluation of many patients with palpitations We'll include, again, some type of monitor to quantify and qualify what we're dealing with, as well as an echocardiography or an ultrasound of the heart or an echo in order to make sure that structurally that the heart is normal. Another abnormal heart rhythm that often manifests first with palpitations is atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is an abnormal rhythm that originates in the top chamber of the heart and can cause a number of issues. The reason it's important to catch atrial fibrillation is that the management of AFib is drastically different from you know a few extra PACs or PVCs. The issue with atrial fibrillation is that the top chamber of the heart beats so rapidly, it fibrillates. That's where it gets its name from. And when it fibrillates, it, the top chamber of the heart doesn't empty appropriately, and it can increase the risk of clots from form, and it can increase the risk of clots forming in that top chamber of the heart. I won't get into too much more detail, but if you want more information about atrial fibrillation, I have a whole other YouTube video if you want more information about it. Other abnormal heart rhythms include Wolf Parkinson White pattern. Or if you're having symptoms, we call it Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. And it's essentially an accessory pathway that can cause some extra heartbeats and other complications. And if you want more information about WPW, I have another YouTube video that I'll put somewhere in this area. Another abnormal heart rhythm is under the umbrella of SVT or supraventricular tachycardias, abnormal rhythms that originate in the top chamber of the heart. And when cardiologists think about SVT, we normally think about two rhythms, AVRT and AVNRT. That's atrioventricular nodal reentrant tachycardia and AV reentrant tachycardia. Cardia. Typically, this diagnosis is made by seeing the rhythm and also a little bit of the history that we get from the patient. And the details of those two diagnoses are outside the scope of this video, but I wanted to at least mention the possibility of them. Another one is atrial tachycardia or an abnormal heart rhythm from the top chamber or atria. And this abnormal focus in the atria 
can fire in quick succession and sometimes does and sometimes doesn't require treatment. And I know I've talked a lot about all these different types of rhythms and I've been a little bit vague about which ones need treatment, which ones are more or less dangerous, because a lot of those details require a more thorough discussion between you and your physician. Each one of those diagnoses can be their own YouTube video all on their own. I've tried to start making and curating content about each one of these different diagnoses as evidenced by the video on AFib, or WPW, but I wanted to at least bring them to your attention that these are some possible diagnoses that can be serious and require further evaluation and discussion between you and your physician. Now we discussed a lot of the electrical abnormalities or abnormal heart rhythms, arrhythmias, that can be a cause of palpitations. There are also structural abnormalities that can cause palpitations. Now let's say a patient comes to me in the clinic and says, doc, I've been having palpitations. What are the next things that a cardiologist or really any doctor would do next. First and foremost is you have to take a good history and physical exam. 90% of what I do can be done by any doctor because it's all about asking the right questions and trying to figure out what is the appropriate test that we can do next, if any. First thing we often do is an EKG. But as many patients are aware, if you're not having your symptoms right then and there, while you're getting the EKG done, you might not see whatever is going on beneath the surface. So what I always tell patients is that an EKG is really valuable at telling us what's happening right now. So if I take the car to the mechanic, because it's making a noise, and I tell them, hey, the car's making a weird noise, but it's not right this second, they, they may or may not be able to help me. I truly don't know because I'm terrible with cars, so I don't, I don't actually know if this analogy works for car engines, but I'm hoping that it does, but I'm getting a little off topic. So anyway, when we get an EKG, if you're having those symptoms and we see a few extra heartbeats, right then and there, I could tell you, yes, you're having a few PACs or PVCs, but often that's not the case. So how do we quantify and qualify or figure out how many extra heartbeats you're actually having and what the underlying rhythm is of those extra heartbeats. That's where we can do different types of extended monitors. Typically they're called Holter monitors. They're essentially EKGs or electrocardiograms that record all of the information of every single heartbeat while you're wearing them. They range from really low tech to really high tech with some of the older ones having simple three lead EKGs, newer ones like MCOTs or Zeo patches from newer models where you can wear them, click a button if you feel those symptoms. And a variety of these can be worn anywhere from a single day up to two or three days and other ones up to one to two weeks sometimes three weeks, depending on the battery range. And which device we end up using at first is often based on how frequently you're having palpitations. If you're telling me it happens every single day, well then we can probably get the information on a Holter monitor for a day or two. But if you tell me it only happens once or twice a week, well then we might need to have a monitor that you wear for one or two weeks. Sometimes you can also use what's called an event monitor where you kind of take it and put it on when you start feeling those symptoms. And we can use that if the symptoms are even more rare, but the symptoms aren't you passing out because it's kind of hard to put on the event monitor if you're passing out. Sometimes in those instances where the symptoms are very rare or maybe are associated with a possible underlying etiology that may drastically change our management, like for instance, atrial fibrillation, we can use an implantable loop recorder. Those are nowadays very, very small, easy to place beneath the skin in the chest and can be left in place for up to three years. They're very small, you don't have to do anything with them. Often you can use a remote monitor that is by your bedside at night in your own home and it electronically relays that information every night and tells us if anything happened. The downside with many of these monitors, implantable loop recorders as well, is that we don't have active monitors. So some of them have this capability, some of them don't, but if you have one, you can simply ask your physician, does my device have an active monitor where you're gonna know about everything that happens immediately? As most of the ones that we use often don't. Meaning if you're having an abnormal heart rhythm, right this second while you're wearing that monitor, we're not gonna know about it until we get that device back, interrogate it, look at it, and get that report. Typically what I tell patients when they're wearing that is to write down any symptoms of what they felt throughout that day. So that that way, when we look back at all of the information that's recorded, because these devices record everything, and when you write down or click the button if you're wearing that type of monitor, it will target and say, hey, if they were feeling a symptom at this time, look at it and evaluate what was happening. That way we can know, oh hey, every single time you felt palpitations, yeah, you're having a few extra heartbeats from the top or bottom chamber of the heart. Or sometimes they're just feeling their own normal heart rate and there's no extra heartbeats that are abnormal or happening and they're just feeling their heartbeat. 
they're still having palpitations because palpitations are the subjective sensation of your heart beating abnormally. But sometimes there's nothing structurally abnormal from the electrical conduction system of the heart. That was a lot, even for me. I mean, I love palpitations. I mean, not palpitations. I don't want you to have palpitations, but I enjoy talking about it. What I wanted to say before I end this video is that if you have any questions about palpitations, I'm happy to answer any questions in the comments about general cardiology knowledge or about any of the topics I mentioned in this video. If you end up commenting about your personal medical health issues, unfortunately, I'm gonna end up just saying that you should probably talk to your physician because I can't comment on anyone's personal medical issues over the internet. And lastly, if you enjoyed this video, found it useful, want me to make future videos about something else in cardiology, whether it's a test, a drug, a diagnosis, drop it in the comments and I'll put it on the to-do list. And if you found this valuable, share it with a friend, subscribe, like it, so that I can keep dedicating some time to making these videos.